in my personal contacts with some of you, I have discovered that even after all the marvelous presentations concerning the love of Christ, some still wonder, does it include me? You are accepted before you are acceptable. If I were to give my remarks a title, it would be God in Bad Company. And I'm going to read a simple text and perhaps make more of it than the average person would see in it. In Psalms 20 and the first verse, the Bible says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. There is an old adage that a man is known by the company he keeps. Or it's put another way, birds of a feather flock together. Or another way, a man's company is an index to his character. God in bad company. In the United States, Hollywood is considered the capital of the show business industry. I read an article about some people who live in Hollywood. The article was concerning name dropping. And it was very critical of a class of people which it referred to as social parasites. Individuals who thrive on the fame and the reputations of others. The article called them status seekers. Men and women who amount to very little themselves, but seek to rise up in the world by writing on the name of an ascending star. And by using the names of other people, important people, they are admitted into high circles and into the confidence of important people and in some cases are able to procure credit because of dropping name. This text that I have read is one of many in which God calls himself the God of Jacob long after Jacob had departed this life. Could God be name-dropping? Could anyone imagine that another name could add luster to the name of God? Let's imagine that it could happen. If so, then why would God call himself the God of Jacob? Why wouldn't he start at the top and say the God of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Heaven, pure and undefiled, in whom there has never been sin, the perfect personification of truth and love and kindness and goodness and righteousness. He could have said that, but he didn't. Or... He could have called himself the God of Gabriel or the God of any one of hundreds of thousands, even millions of unfallen beings of unequal strength, clothed with light. But God did not say the God of Gabriel. 
He might have said the God of Melchizedek, flawless priest of Salem, but he didn't. He could have said, I am the God of Joseph, unspoiled by vice and lust, a young man strong of character, resolute concerning righteousness, a young man faithful, a young man who preferred to go to jail rather than make love to a beautiful woman and thus dishonor his body and his God. He could have said, I'm the God of Joseph, but he did not. He might have said, I am the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These careful vegetarians, conscientious, Young men who faced the fiery furnace rather than bow down to the wrong God while listening to the wrong kind of music. But he didn't. He might have said, I am the God of Daniel who loved prayer so much he went into a lion's den rather than give it up. But he didn't. He might have said, I am the God of the Virgin Mary A woman so flawlessly pure and clean that her body was chosen as the vessel to bear the unborn and only begotten Son of God, but he didn't. In that text and many others, long after he had changed the name of the subject, God called himself the God of Jacob. And I would almost ask the question, Lord, if you're going to drop names, why That name. For the name Jacob means supplanter, thief, fraud, con artist. The name Jacob comes down to us stained by a dishonest deed. What kind of company is that? I might even say, oh God, aren't you ashamed to have your name linked? with the name of a thief. And he would respond, I am the God who keeps bad company. Jacob had stolen his brother's birthright. And while fleeing from the presence of that brother, he came to a place where in weariness he lay down to sleep. And there God made a covenant with him. He went on down to the land of his kinsman Laban. And after more than 20 years he was returning home when he got word that his brother was coming out with an army of armed men. This man Jacob was cast into consternation with heavy and depressing anxiety. He turned his back away from his wife, his family, his herdsmen walked across the brook Jabbok and fell down on his face and began pleading with God. As darkness fell, someone took hold of him. Jacob thought surely he was in the hand of a thief, a robber, and that his life was in danger. And he began to struggle as one would struggle to save and preserve his life. It was not until the visitor touched his thigh and crippled him that he understood it was the Lord according to the spirit of prophecy. And when Jacob knew it was the Lord, he began to weep and to cry and to hold on for dear life. Sometimes, it seems we are incapable of recognizing the Lord until he touches our experience with some crippling thing. And then he cried out. Then he began to weep and to pray. In a little while, the crimson dawn began to break. And the Lord said to Jacob, let me go. 
And Jacob responded, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Ellen White says, Jacob was not boasting of physical strength to retain the Lord. Had he been doing so, he would have been killed. That isn't what he meant at all. He did not mean I'm strong enough to hold you and I won't let go. What he meant was, for 20 years or more, I have dared to believe the promise of God, the covenant which was made with me at Bethel. I have believed that. I have lived for that. I have trusted that. I have longed for its fulfillment. And now that I am returning home, I get word that my brother is coming with an army to kill me. And I had a moment when my faith hung in the balance and I was tempted to doubt. But now that I know the Lord has met me, my faith lays hold on God. My confidence in Him is renewed. And my faith will not let you go except you bless me and confirm the covenant again with me. It was then that the Lord said, What is thy name? A rhetorical question, and Jacob answered, My name is Jacob. What does it mean? It means liar, thief, confidence man, one who takes by fraud. I can imagine he cast his eyes down to the ground when he repeated his own name. It was then he heard the Lord say, Henceforth, thou shalt be called Israel, for thou hast wrestled with God and prevailed. My young friends, God can still change your name. I read in the spirit of prophecy that when we make that decision and surrender the will, and as we learned already, God has to lead us into that. When we do it, and when we in sincerity follow on to know the Lord, reproach will be lifted from us. God can change your name. You might be known in your community as a swinger. God can change your name. You might be known in your community as a flirt. God can change your name. You might be known in your community as a thief or a drunkard or a drug addict or even a homosexual. Whatever it is by which you are known, God can change your name by giving you such an astounding victory that those who have known you before will see a brand new you and will change their assessment of you. Henceforth thou shalt be called Israel, for thou hast wrestled with God and prevailed. Many times God is referred to in the Old Testament as the God of Israel. Many times you read that. But frankly, I am encouraged to see that occasionally God reverts and He lets us know and He lets generations yet unborn know that He is the God of Jacob, the God who transforms, the God who changes a man all together. And just so we will never forget, he says, I am the God of Jacob, the God who keeps bad company. Tonight, considering my own background and considering what he did for me, I thank God that he condescends to keep bad company. In the Bible, there is the story of a woman whose name was Rahab. And the Bible says she was a harlot. That means a prostitute. I can almost picture this woman, a loose woman with a bad reputation, a woman of the streets, 
A woman with golden coins about her forehead, advertising her trade in flesh. A woman with tight Canaanitish garments. A woman who enjoyed wearing that which was sexy and sheer. And whenever the caravans came in from the desert, she painted herself and went out to meet them. It could have been that on one occasion, the men were excited about other things, and she listened as they talked. She heard them speak of plagues on the mighty land of Egypt. She heard them speak of a great sea splitting in middle and rolling back so that millions of people could pass over on dry land. She might have heard them speak of water coming out of a dry rock, of a pillar of fire that walked. When she heard it, she was excited. She listened with all ears and made a decision that she believed in a God that could do those things. Rahab returned to her home tore up her little black book, changed her clothes, washed her face, and lived sustained by her faith in a God she had never seen and about whom she knew so little. When finally the time came that the men of Israel came to her country, she gave them succor and made a confession of faith in their God. I can imagine some of her friends thought she was crazy. Why, even if that God is all they say he is, he would have nothing to do with a woman like you. Have you lost your mind? You didn't see the plagues fall. You didn't see bread from heaven. You didn't see the Red Sea pot. Rahab probably answered, it is true. I did not see, but I have heard and I believe and I will trust that God to give me salvation when he gives this land to his people. And because of her faith, regardless of her reputation, regardless of her past life, because of her faith, she was honored of God and her life was spared and the lives of all her family were spared. That's wonderful. But that isn't all. When you turn to Hebrews 11 and begin to read God's honor roll, those who will be saved by faith in verse 31, the name of Rahab the prostitute appears. She will be in the kingdom of God because God keeps bad company. Frankly, it seems to me that would be enough of a miracle concerning this woman. But if you read from Matthew chapter 1, you will read the genealogy of Christ's earthly family. And as you read down through those names, suddenly you come upon the name of Rahab. She's called Rachab in the authorized version. But in other versions and translations, she is called Rahab. That same harlot is in the family tree of Jesus Christ. An illustration of the amazing grace of God that will save the low wretches of this earth if they will to be saved and because of His grace and love God keeps bad company. Tonight I'm thankful for that. At the close of this meeting I'm glad to say one more time that if you want salvation, God is desperate to give it to you, and He will love you as much as He loves anybody alive. For His love toward all men is a perfect love. I'm glad He said He's not ashamed to be called 
our brother or to call us brethren. You know, sometimes people are ashamed of you. People will mock you, make fun of you, look down their noses at you. But God is not like that. Please don't judge Christ by folk who call themselves Christians and are not. One of the reasons so many people have so little confidence in Jesus, they are watching Christians and judging Christ by them. Men and women who are as guilty as anyone else dare to look down their noses and criticize those who happen to fall into low estate or into sin, or into mistakes. God, who alone is holy, does not so regard us. This is a youth's congress. And I will say, as I heard expressed here today, I personally have great confidence in the youth of this church. I would say further to some of those older folks who criticize young people incessantly, we ought to stop doing it. Really, our youth need prayer and less criticism. In fact, the only reason some of the older ones are not doing exactly what the young folk do is because they're too old. And in many cases, that is why they are so critical. Thank God for his love for young people. Now, if you will, I hate to make a personal reference, but please pardon me. And weather and my summer hay fever that came when I flew out of winter into your summer. I believe we'll be all right, so please bear with me and listen. There was a handsome king in Israel, a king chosen by God, given a prosperous reign, but he made a mistake and he soiled his character and his name, and because of his fault, his own home was broken and destroyed. His own children became the heavy burden of his heart. And finally, this king turned back to God with a prayer of confession unequaled anywhere in all the Bible. He pleaded for forgiveness. He pleaded for cleansing. He pleaded with God to blot out his transgressions. And God not only heard David, he answered his prayer and said, David is a man after my own heart. David then saw that the Lord is slow to anger, that his mercy endureth forever, and that he delights to pardon. But as you read David's experience, you discover that while the great God of heaven forgave him freely, people would not forgive him. On one occasion, folk who had been his friends threw rocks at him. Wherever David looked, he was reminded of his sin, even though God had forgiven it. David was looking around amongst the people for someone to encourage him. Finally, it must have dawned on David, if you look to people for encouragement, you won't find very much. So he made a decision. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. When he turned from man to God, David said, he restoreth my soul. Indeed, he continued in Psalms 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. 
And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. David reached this point, received the gift of salvation because God keeps bad company. My young friends, surely David did wrong. Surely David committed a shameful sin. Surely David deserved the criticism he received and the reproach he had to bear. But thank God, Jesus keeps bad company and so loved this man that after his prayer of confession, God was willing and able to save him and to restore him. God keeps bad company. Over and over in the Bible, there are illustrations to bear out this fact. One of the greatest miracles in all the Bible is Peter. Peter, a disciple, who, when the pressure came, not only denied the Lord, but cursed and swore he had nothing to do with him. But thank God, later on that night, Peter went out and fell face down. Someone said, in the same place where Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter went out there. And if he found that spot, it's possible that the blood of Jesus was still on the grass. And as he prostrated himself, weeping and crying, God heard his prayer. And Peter was restored. Because God keeps bad company. Oh, how grateful I am for this realization tonight. Peter had denied the Lord because of fear. Human fear, natural fear, caused him to draw back and deny his Lord. But after his conversion, he was not scared anymore. He was able to look a mob in the eye and say to them, we ought to obey God rather than man. And when he was imprisoned, he was able to sing to the glory of God because of God's marvelous redemption in his behalf and because God keeps bad company. Let me give you one other familiar illustration. The thief on the cross. Now he was what he was called a thief. And as he was hanging on the cross, it could have been that the smell of liquor was on his breath. It could have been that his belly was full of foul obscenities. But as he was hanging there and got a glimpse of the man on the cross in the middle, somehow, by the grace of God, memories began to conjure up the days when he went into the synagogue, when he heard the rabbis read from the prophecies. And they read of one who would come and be bruised and wounded that sinners might live. And as that thief stared at Christ, it dawned on his darkened intellect, this man must be the Lord. He acknowledged that when he called him Lord. He said, Lord, remember me. That thief knew he didn't deserve anything. That thief knew that what he deserved was what he was getting. When he asked to be remembered, he was not asking for justice. He was asking for grace. And he was not asking for justice, he was asking for grace. And the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping bad company, 
on Calvary. Stop dying long enough to hear and answer that thief's prayer. Jesus said unto him, I'm telling you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. My young friends, embrace the truth that God keeps bad company, that the Lord loves sinners though he hates sin, that he is able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him. Accept it. You can't explain it. Just believe it. Someone said, if you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind. But if you don't believe it, you're going to lose your soul. We are saved by faith. Believe that God is that kind of a God. And approach him as the thief approached him. Crying for mercy. Crying to be remembered with grace. And Jesus will not fail you because he is no respecter of persons. He will not save a thief and let you be lost if you come to him as the thief did. Jesus keeps bad company and delights in saving hard cases. That's the Christ I recommend to you tonight. There are things you can do There are attitudes you can assume. There are crowds you can run with. And your own parents will write you off. I have met young people all over the world who had been chased out of their homes by their parents. I baptized a man and his family. And after a year or so, his 14-year-old girl got pregnant. When I heard about it, I went driving out to that house as fast as I could go. And when I got there, the father was in a rage. And what he was saying to that girl didn't need to be said. He was raging. He was furious. I never heard such hard things from a father. And finally he said to her, I want you to get out of my house and never darken my door again. Well, I realize you ought to be careful meddling in family affairs. But it was more than that. I ran between him and his daughter. I said, now you hold on here a minute. I want you to listen to me. That girl is 14 years of age. If you throw her away, where is she going? And besides, considering the sins you told me about in your life, suppose God did that to you. The father was a good man. His problem was more his own hurt pride than the desperate condition of his daughter. It was selfishness that made him act like that. He was worried about what neighbors would say about him and his family, and his good name, and I told him so. Suppose God had treated you like that, or suppose he treats you like that the next time you sin. The father didn't say a word. He just dropped his head. I know it was a great battle for a man like that. He stood there looking down at the ground in a little while, I watched the tears begin to fall and drop off on the floor. And then without saying a word, he reached out to that scared, frail little girl and enfolded her in his giant arms and held her so tightly she could hardly breathe. Reconciliation, mercy, grace, patience, kindness. God keeps bad company. And even when your friends disown you and your parents cast you away, when nobody wants to be bothered with you, God says, I'll take you. I'll take you. When you're a laughing stock, when your life is a mess, when your girlfriend has turned her back 
and your boyfriend turns up his nose, God says, I'll take you. I'll take you. And I thank God for that, that he keeps bad company, that he saves rotten sinners. And I want to say to the worst sinner under this canvas tonight, God is talking to you right now. He loves you perfectly. That means he cannot love the preacher more than he loves you. He cannot love Elder Hancock more than he loves you. He cannot love Elder Vinden more than he loves you. He cannot love my friend over here more than he loves you. For his love is perfect toward you and he keeps bad company. He's left the record to encourage you. Come unto me. I will take you. I will take you. I've had so many true experiences with this. There was a young man baptized several years ago. He's one of my best friends now. He was quite a musician. But he came out of a dark and awful moral situation. I believe he was sincere when he joined the church. And he played the organ for the church for several years when he fell into a moral pit and they disfellowshipped him. He wept and he cried. And as soon as they put him out of the church and opened the door, he came right back and took his stand. They baptized him. And he went on for another five or six years. And then the devil set a trap again. He fell right back into the same kind of trap. And he wept again, and he cried again, and he was sorry again. But the church decided we don't want any part of it. It was an official decision of that church. They were a small church in a small town. They had a reputation to keep up. So when he tried to come back the next time, they simply ignored him. When they made an appeal and if he came forward, that was all there was to it. Nobody visited. Nobody called him. As a matter of fact, he told me they effectually ostracized him altogether. It went on for so long. That young man told me later on, he came home one day and he looked in his trunk and he took out a pistol that he had had for years. It was still loaded. He laid it on the bed next to the telephone and he got a chair and he sat staring at the gun and staring at the phone. One voice was telling him to blow his own brains out. The other was saying, why won't the phone ring? Why won't somebody at least say hello to me? That's the loneliness of sin. That's the anguish he felt in his heart. By the grace of God, he endured and put the gun up. Onto my desk came a letter of invitation. Pastor Brooks, we want you to come and spend the weekend with our church in revival services. I said yes. Months went by. The appointment came. And when we got there, the crowds were so large, the church was not big enough. And on Sabbath, they rented a high school auditorium. The school auditorium was packed. And Elder Vinden, it was one of those days when heaven came down. One of those days when you could feel the presence of God. An appeal was made and dozens came forward. And then we closed the service. And when I turned to walk off the stage, standing over behind the curtain was this young man. Had his hat in his hand. He was ashamed to sit in the audience. Ashamed to be seen in a congregation. He sneaked in the back door. And he stood off stage, hat in hand. When I spotted him, I started straight toward him. Well, these same pastors and elders who refused to let him back in had to go with me because I was guest and they were the host. 
And when I stop, they stop. The young man was standing there, staring straight out at the pulpit, and I saw something that touched and broke my heart. The tears were running off his cheeks and dropping to the floor, and at his feet there was a large, dark circle made by the moisture of his own tears as he stood off there listening to the Word of God. I put my hands on his shoulders. I looked him straight in the eye. He was so filled up emotionally, he couldn't speak. I called his name, and I said, Son, you love God, don't you? He just nodded his head, the tears falling. I said, I've got good news. God loves you. Welcome home again. Well, after I said that, the elders decided they better shake his head. Each one did so. He told him that he could be baptized one more time into the Lord's church. Well, something happened not only in his heart with the Lord, but between us. He appreciated it so much, he began to write to me. He heard I was going to run a big evangelistic campaign. He said, Pastor, would you let me come and work with you? I don't care what you want me to do. If you just want me to dig a ditch and watch the tent, I'll do that. I wrote back and said, come on. That young man came and worked with me. And I had a young lady who was the soloist for my meeting. And you know how the Lord works? The two of them were attracted to each other. And by the time the meeting was over, they had sent out their invitations. They got to be husband and wife. When I left to go over into Chicago, they said to me, Pastor, let us go with you. I said, come on. And because of their performance and the way God blessed it, the conference hired them both as conference workers. They have been such since 1971, and the two of them have led hundreds and hundreds of souls into the truth, and tonight they are in evangelism together. Why don't you say amen, I said. Beloved, I told you that. To let you know that God keeps bad company. He loves no good. He reaches out to rotten folks. The kind that are rejected by society. The Lord says, I will take you. I will take you. I read that David's army, which was one of the most successful armies ever to fight a battle, was made up of rejects and deserters. A ragtag army of castoffs. The Lord's army is made up of sinners. He'll take you. Doesn't matter what you've done, when you did it, how bad it is. If you will turn to Him and will to be saved, you will be saved. For you are accepted by the beloved God before you are acceptable. I read a statement in the spirit of prophecy that says those closest to the throne of God will be those who have overcome the greatest amount of difficulty and sin. Now if that isn't an encouraging word, I don't know what to say to you. When we all get to heaven, we're going to stand in our places and those closest to the throne of God will be those whom he has forgiven the most and who required the most grace in order to be there. God's going to show them off. He will be especially proud of these hard cases that were saved by the blood of Jesus for their salvation proves the efficacy of the grace of Jesus Christ wrought through his crucifixion his burial and his resurrection and his atoning ministry. They will be, in a special sense, trophies for Jesus. He keeps bad company. In closing, I have to tell you about Big Luke. 
Now, if you saw Big Lou, you'd know why he's called that. He is one big, rough fellow. The first time I met him, he had just joined the Adventist church. And he was giving his testimony before a group of us. Luke was a drug addict, heavily hooked on drugs. When I met his wife, her teeth were missing in the front. Luke said in his own testimony, he was responsible for that. He said his first act, often when coming home under the influence of the devil, was to abuse his wife even before he spoke a word. Me. The children in his community ran when they saw him coming down the street. Luke Mitchell had a reputation. Everybody feared him, and everybody stayed out of his way, including his own family. One day, Luke came home, and he said when he got there, he found his wife reading the Bible. Now, Luke said he doesn't know why that enraged him so much, but it did. He said the first thing he did was to strike her, and then he snatched the Bible out of her hand, and turning around to a trash can, he slammed it into the trash as hard as he could throw it, and then announced there will be no Bible reading in this house until I say so. And then Luke said that he stormed his way upstairs, head splitting, conscience burning, the influence of his last fix wearing off, miserable, wretched, no self-esteem. Bitter, angry, child of the devil, redeemable. Luke intended to fall across the bed and try to find some relief in sleep. But he said to us in that small congregation, as he approached the bed, the first thing he saw was a Bible on the table by the bed. And having been just angered by a Bible, he reached and grabbed this one and drew back to throw it in the trash when he got an idea. Luke said he held the Bible up and he looked up toward the ceiling and he said, God, if you're up there, I'm going to give you one chance to speak to me. And if you are a God, this shouldn't be too hard for you. He said, I'm going to throw this Bible across the room. And when it falls, I want it to fall open. And I'm going to touch it. And wherever I touch it, if you are a God, I want you to speak to me out of the Word. He's talking about somebody being worthy. What kind of approach is this? Luke Mitchell drew back that great big arm and he let the word of God go zinging across the room. It hit the wall with a fierce impact. It fell to the floor and surely enough, it fell open. Luke said he started across the room and when he knelt down, he closed his eyes for a moment and he reached out and he put his finger on the page. Luke was talking softly as he told this, and at this point his eyes were moist, and this is the way he said it. He said, ladies and gentlemen, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Isaiah chapter 45. That's the way he said it to us. As quickly as I could, I snatched my Bible open to Isaiah 45, and Luke Mitchell said, the verse that I touched was verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. 
There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. The amazing thing to me was, Luke didn't have to open his Bible. Every single word exactly in place. He had quoted it verbatim. He had challenged God. A no good drug addict. No respect in his home. No respect in his community. Even children ran from him. Who in the world did he think he was to talk to God like that? He drew back the sacred word of God. Slammed it with contempt against the wall as though it had been so much trash. But he said, God, speak to me. And when he put his finger out, God said, I am the Lord. And beside me, there is none else. Luke Mitchell, right now, is a ministerial student at Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama. His wife is a student in the Department of Education, and his children are in church school. And Luke Mitchell today is a soul winner. You know how I know? Because before he left for college, I ran a campaign in his town, and Luke Mitchell brought seven drug addicts every night to my meetings, and we baptized one of them. My friends tonight, you who have been discouraged, you who still wonder if God has accepted you, you who are still being told by the devil you've gone too far, you've sunk too low, you are unworthy, you who doubt if God would fool with you, I'm saying to you tonight, if God would save Luke Mitchell, and if God would save, save that worker I told you about, and if you will save the thief on the cross and Rahab the prostitute, you ought to be encouraged tonight to know that God keeps bad company and delights in making them good. And tonight, that God extends the hand of friendship one more time before this meeting closes. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please, in prayer. You know, this has been a beautiful evening for me. It's had almost a festive atmosphere. Lovely young people bringing up these lovely gifts. There was laughter and, and talking and all of that just fine. But I ask you to be sober now, for I'm going to make an appeal tonight. I do this because I'm told to do it. Told by the Lord to do it. It could be that one person here tonight, or more than one, one person who really has desired to know Jesus this weekend and somehow felt that you just didn't get to know him because of your own lack of faith in him and his goodness. It could be that tonight God has spoken to you saying, I'll take you. I'll take you. If there is such a person, I'm going to pause a moment and ask you to stand right now. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed, and everybody who knows the Lord ought to be praying for any person who might be suffering in the valley of decision at this moment. If you feel that way, would you stand now and say to the Lord, I believe you. I accept your goodness. I will come to you. Now, my friends, this is no general appeal. I'm not talking to people who are already good Christians. I'm talking to those who fit what I have described. You want to be the Lord. You came here hoping something would happen, but your lack of faith has precluded it until now. But right now in this final meeting, you are deciding, Lord, 
I'm no good, but you're good. I'm not strong, but you're strong. I'm not wise, but you're wise. I'm not pure, but you're pure. And I want to make my decision tonight. There are some standing. I'm going to ask you to do something now, to slip out of the pew where you are and come down here and stand in front of this platform. Would you do that? Don't ever be ashamed to stand for the Lord. Just come on. There's going to be another appeal too. But I want this group to come first. Is there a backslider? Now please, don't misunderstand me. I don't want emotional folk just getting up, coming down here. Keep your seat unless you are in that category I mentioned. And if you are, don't be ashamed to come. If you have felt so no good, you thought you didn't have a chance, come. Just press in around the front of this stage, please. And you don't even have to look around at those folk out there. The nosy ones who don't know how to pray are staring. Don't look around at them. Those who matter are praying. Just a moment now, while we wait for these souls to respond to the goodness of the Lord. Today we heard about the enormous expense involved in a meeting like this. The other day the interviewer from the television station looked at me and said, Why do you have this kind of a meeting? Why? There were many answers and not much time to give any. We pointed out that there's power in fellowship. The Lord says, Where my people gather, there am I. And I said further, We are here to discuss the Word of God. And lives will be affected. And these young people will go back to their cities and their islands and make a moral statement for God. That's why we have this meeting. They don't cost in the long run. They pay. God has been here all week. My own soul has been fed. I have felt drawn Godward by the mighty messages and fellowship. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Is there someone else? You know you who talked to us. Baptized at 10 years old. Never really felt you've had a genuine experience. That slid and did everything big enough to do. And you want to come now and say, Lord, this is a new beginning. I want to join the church. I want to be in that number that shall be saved. I want to do your will. And I believe now that you will accept me. So I accept thee. While they're coming, I'm going to make a second appeal. And these who answer this appeal don't have to stand. But you know, the reason these men go to all of this labor and expense for a meeting like this is, number one, they have a mighty love for young people. And number two, they have a greater love for God and for His work. They want to see young people inspired to go back to these dark islands dark counties, dark cities, dark countries, and start a little fire burning. They want to see young people committed, young people with better ideas, young people who might have made up their minds to be this or that or the other, but under the influence of the Holy Ghost will decide, I think I want to give my life in service to the Lord. And so this next appeal is this one. I don't know. It could be that some young person here has decided he'd like to be in the gospel ministry. Maybe the Lord has spoken to you since you've been here. Maybe the Lord has said, I want you. I choose you.